Now, here's the thing that I find with especially commission-only sales roles is that when you hire someone in a commission-only sales role, they want to go out and they need to start making money from tomorrow. Well, the question you have to ask is, do you want to suck at making money? Like for me, I could have made pretty much no money, like $70 a day for forever as an introvert. And sometimes I'd be lucky and I maybe get a sale every 56 doors and other days it'd be 114. Or I could have spent six hours practicing the process, sorry, eight hours a day practicing the process over the course of six weeks. Now, of course, it was a terrible time and I wouldn't wish that six weeks on anyone, but now I've benefited from it my entire life. So when you think about as an organization, whether it's worth having a planned presentation, scripting out what you say, firstly, anyone that says, oh, you know, I read that script, but you know, I prefer to do it my way. What they're saying is I'm too lazy to learn a planned process because a, a planned process is going to deliver them great results. And they're like, oh yeah, but the way you say it doesn't really work for me. I'm like, okay, why don't you go away and learn that first? And then if you want to change it, we can talk about that. As soon as they learn it, they're like, oh, wow, you know, it delivers such great results. Why would I change it? So for me, any organization needs a planned presentation. It's, it's funny how many small businesses that I work with and their dream is to hire a sales guy or a high, say, hire a sales girl and say, you know, you go sell for me and I'll just do the business thing. And it's really interesting, but I'm like, you're going to hire someone, you're going to pay them $75,000, $150,000 a year. Six months from now, they, the only person they've sold is you. They've told you about their amazing pipeline. They've told you everything that's going on. And then you've realized there's nothing there and no deals have been made. So even the smallest micro business needs to create, go out and learn sales themselves, then turn it into a full sales process themselves, write out exactly what they say, then hire someone to learn their system for selling it. And then that way, firstly, you'll know sales. So you won't buy into all their excuses that won't be realistic. And then secondly, you'll make sure that they're delivering a consistent result. And then maybe if they're a better salesperson than you, they'll deliver a better result, but at least you'll get them to that baseline. And that's the important thing, especially when you're inducting new people is most people, they don't even have, forget about a whole sales script. They don't even have a story playbook. So you've got these people with no experience and they're just throwing out jargon about their product and it, it's miserable for them, but it's also horrible for your results. So just getting somebody, one of the things that I do for a lot of you know, big tech companies is, you know, they've got all these jargon based you know, explanations and I'm like, okay, you need stories. Oh, we tell stories, you know, but they're always customer wanted this. So we gave it to them and we create what I call just the three story system. So we pick one sales play. We look at the three major problems that the average buyer would have that our product solves. And then we look for three, real people. So if, if you're listening and the marketers are the ones that control that sort of stuff, okay. you need to bring them into the dialogue because what you need to do is understand that if you know three problems, you can tell a story about each one of them. If you get three common objections, you can have a story of a customer that had that objection, decided to trust you and got an amazing outcome. Now, when I say story, I don't just mean customer wanted this, so we gave it to them. I'm talking about stories that you've well structured that become more like the story of how you met your partner. You know, at the start, they were a little bit bulky, but you, you there were parts that you've you know, got rid of because people didn't enjoy them. There's parts that you now embellish a little bit more. You know, they're more like theatrical masterpieces that when a customer listens to it, they're like, oh, I need this. Or, oh, he's totally right. Now, stories have the power to short circuit the logical mind so you can speak to the, directly to the emotional mind. So when you get an objection when you're cold calling, if you tell a story, they go from, this guy's been talking for too long. Can I get him out? Can I get him off the phone or can I get him out of my office? To, oh, story time. And they just listen. Also, people remember up to 22 times more embedded into a story than they would from random facts. And more importantly, especially for introverts, it activates the reticular activating system of our brain, which means our brains actually synchronize. So if you struggle to foster real rapport, initially, if you tell a story, that'll create artificial rapport that introverts are great at turning any rapport into a really deep and rich relationship. The extroverts have an advantage of striking up rapport straight away, but if you leverage story, as soon as you get into a story, your brains will synchronize, and from that point onwards, you'll have a much bigger advantage than your extroverted counterparts. That was so gold. Nugget. And if you're listening to this, that was the nugget of the day, in my opinion. Um, so thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. I found, you know, obviously you've heard, you know, stories tell or people tell, tell stories sell, right? Like it's kind of that concept of, I love how you said it short circuit, it short circuits the logical mind and goes straight to the emotional mind like that. Like I never looked at it like that, where 
you know, so many people are just trying to back dump on people. Of, like, here's what my thing does. Versus- Let me pull out my brochure and show you. It's yeah. even worse than that most of the time. Yeah, exactly. And I watch them go through this PowerPoint and I'm just like, you realize that I, I, I think I took a middle nap in the, in somewhere in between in your presentation. And then- uh, <laughs> And the customer doesn't care. Like, they're like, none of this is relevant to me. None of it I'm going to remember. All they want to know is, am I going to lose my job for making this decision? And then, you know, it all going wrong. Or can you tell me, give me an example of how it worked? I mean, you could explain the product and give a testimonial at the same time through a story. And one of the things that I think will help is a lot of the people that are like on the fence about whether they need to fully document their sales process. What I always suggest is document your stories first and make sure that your salespeople are just using one of those stories in every sales activity. And what you'll have is such a skyrocketing effect to the closure rate, your sales cycle will shorten. And you'll find that even when you're onboarding new people, the ability to turn them into effective members of your team will happen much, much sooner. As soon as you deliver that ROI just from that small initiative, then you can look at extending it to a greater sales process. That gives you a way to baby step in. You know, yeah. we worked with a commercial real estate company that literally six months in, it was there were three principals and they decided to grow by hiring a bunch of, you know, 20-year-old you know, people to, to, to get into the industry. And it was really interesting. After six months, he said, you know, Volney, the owner, said, we really have two groups of people. We've got the introvert that best characterized by Thomas. And now Thomas has been working with us for six months in his own words. He's only made one appointment that was borderline useless, right? Can you imagine me and Thomas? It would be horrible. He's like, but that's actually our best salesperson compared to the extroverts that have no idea what they're doing, but they're just getting hyped up on coffee, hammering the phone and they're bulldozing people. But the C-level executives are just hanging up. We're just getting middle managers that don't want the appointment, but they can't make a decision either. So we get there and they're like, why are you wasting my time? It's, it's bad for the brand. They, so they asked me to come in and give them a structure for getting people to get more quality appointments. So what I did is I taught them the objection cushion, which is, you know, when they get an objection, I perfectly understand. Last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. However, right. I, I, I listened. I understand that you're busy. However, now the word, but is not the same. Right now, for those people, for those blokes listening that are married, go home and say, dear, you look beautiful in that dress, but, and see what happens, right? It's not going to work out for you. Trust me. The word, however, is an additional term. So it's much, much more valuable, right? And it means, so when you say to a customer that, you, you say, I perfectly understand. Last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. However, have you considered this other piece of information? It's an additional term. And what I got them to then do is to tell a story, but a much more robust story with emotional elements to it about a customer. And we can talk about what the key elements of the story are that might be helpful for, you, for your audience in a second. But the, what they did is they then started delivering stories. And instantly, they started to realize that the C-level executive would normally give them eight seconds on the phone before their brain would go, no, thank you, and hang up. As soon as they got into a story, it was like the, the situation just shifted and they got the customer on the phone for an average of two minutes and 35 seconds. And all of a sudden, I mean, you imagine as a, as a cold caller, getting somebody to listen for two and a half minutes over eight seconds, massive difference. difference. And what you can do in that time, but also at the end, you know, if you're saying, oh, you, you've got this problem or, you know, these things will help you overcome that, the question becomes, will it or will it not? And their logical brain's trying to decipher that. But when you tell a story, it's like, well, I can't disagree with that story. It's an experience that that person had. It worked for them. But then the moral of the story is, if it worked for them, they're just like you, so we can get you to the same outcome. Mm -hmm. So short circuiting the logical mind, speaking directly to the emotional mind, which, by the way, doesn't interpret fact from fiction. So it interprets all the detail as, fa as, as factual because when your emotional mind's listening, it's just trying to determine what the moral of the story is. And yeah. then having them remember the amount of times I used to have reps that, you know, we'd get customers call up later and they'd be like, the, customer, the, the sales rep said this, this, this. And they're like, I didn't say that. He just doesn't remember what I explained. I'm like, you didn't tell the story, did you? And you could pull it out instantly. And they're like, well, there's no way they're going to remember it if I tell a story. I'm like, really? Well, let's, let's test that out for a second. Everyone listening, I'm going to say three random items. Let's think about it. Um, chairs, porridge, and beds. Now, don't write those items down. But a year from now, I want you to recite what those are. Just set a calendar invitation and, and remind yourself what those items are. No one's going to remember it, right? But if I said Goldilocks and the three bears, you, you know, she sat in the chair, she ate the porridge, she slept in the bed, right? Even a story you probably haven't heard in a long, long time. 
The reason for that is we attach detail to the chronology of the story and therefore it becomes more tangible and more real to us. So not only are they going to stay on the phone and listen to us more, they're actually going to remember what we said and feel like they fostered a stronger relationship because of it. Like when I used to sell telecommunications door to door, I used to sometimes smile when I'd go in and I'd see their desk and they've got 10 other brochures sitting next to them because I I knew that they'd remember what I said, more of what I said than all those other 10 reps combined because they were brochure salespeople, they sold with facts. And I just walked in and as soon as I got my chance, I told one of my stories and then bang, we're straight into a deal. I love that. I literally say the same motto. I'm like, I don't care if I'm the 10th guy, I'm going to be 10 times better than the other nine guys. You know what I mean? Like, because I swear there's so many salespeople out there that are so badly trained or just not trained or just not, like they, they don't listen to what we just, talked about and they don't think that it's important so they just keep doing what they're doing but just because you've been selling for five years doesn't make you good you know what I mean it just makes you been selling for five years I mean I can make someone tell like literally what we did you know and we've done this for a couple of big tech companies where we write three stories and we give them to the new people and we get them to go out and they're out selling some of the people who've been doing it five ten years because for the first time, their customers actually get what they're talking about. So, I mean, with one story, like the guys at Collier's, we gave them one story that made them sound, I mean, no one wants to buy commercial real estate off a kid, but if they tell a story that looks like they've got, makes them look like they've got 30 years experience, it's transformative. Now, by the way, for the people listening that have just started their commission only jobs, they don't need to be your stories. I mean, you're, you're selling someone else's product, right? Or someone else's service. So all you've got to do is change the, I worked with someone to we worked with someone and you can yeah. inherit any of the stories from any of the high performers, anyone that's delivered the product because you're representing somebody else's brand. But when I talk about stories, I want you to really hear me when I talk about this. The stories that most people talk about, they talk about customer wanted this, so we gave it to them. You know, I remember when I worked for a big billion dollar tech company and I I had to write a story for them because what I agreed to do is tell a story from stage like I worked for their organization, right? So I'd say, so what does a good story look like? And then I would tell this three and a half minute story complete with this emotional roller coaster that went through it. And then at the end, I'd say, so who here thinks I work for, I've worked for your organization for at least 10 years? And like everyone put their hands up. And I'm like, no, I actually wrote, I actually interviewed for this story six weeks ago. I wrote it last week. I remembered it yesterday. And now I'm delivering it today. If I can sound like I've got this much experience, I mean, it was complete with industry acronyms and everything because cloud-based technology is super complicated, but it didn't sound complicated in this story, which is why it was tangible to the guy buying it because they don't want to understand the tech. They just want to know what's going to work, right? But for me, when I was doing this, I literally interrogated these six guys for literally 45 minutes. And at the end, I told them this story back in like 45 seconds. Like, how did you do that? And I'm like, well, it's a story structure that I'm going to be teaching you in a couple of weeks. But I said, there's some things I don't know. Like, firstly, you keep calling the person the CTO. Like, help me understand the CTO, does he have a name? And they're like, well, yeah, it's David. I'm like, well, why don't you mention that? Because I mean, I can't feel a CTO's plight, but when you talk about David, I can feel it all. But secondly, let's ask, let me ask you another question. Why did they want to go to the cloud in the first place? And he's like, well, what do you mean? I mean, we've been, I said, you've been chasing them for years, but all of a sudden they decided they want to go to the cloud. Why did they decide to go to the cloud now? They didn't know the answer. So they had to go away and figure it out. Turns out this was a government organization and it was a cloud-based company that, sorry, it was a tech, it was a government organization that kept everything in their server farms. And they were like, no, nope, you know what? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, the servers crashed just before Christmas. They couldn't run payroll. Thousands of staff, biggest spending season of the year, they couldn't run pay, payroll for anyone. And they had to keep all their IT team working over Christmas to get everyone paid before New Year's. So he ruined Christmas for his entire team. And there was probably other people that couldn't afford to pay their rent during that time. He vowed never to be in that situation again. So he moved it to cloud and actually got a promotion afterwards. He was worried about losing his job because he handled it so well and did the hard work. He got a promotion because of the fact that it was done so well and because this organization handled it so effectively. So you think about a story. It's not, we had a customer that wanted to go into the cloud and we got him to the cloud. It was like, David constantly said, no, if we got an objection, like, no, Oh, if I ain't broke, we're not going to fix it. We're, we're good with this. Well, David thought the same thing. So while I perfectly understand the last thing I want to do is waste any of your time, 
one thing I do want to say to you is that we had many people that have said that. Actually, David's a great example. Let me explain. You know, he thought everything was fine. It was only the day before Christmas when they were going to run payroll and everything crashed that he changed his mind. Let me explain further. And then you get to the outcome about how you held their hand through the whole process, how great the technology is. So while I totally understand where you're at right now, and the last thing I want to do is push you to do something you don't want. This ain't broke, don't fix it mentality may not be the right choice. Just take a second to really think about that because I'd hate for you to end up like David. Ooh, it's good. Good. I love it. <laughs>